Welcome. This is an episode on color in more detail. So we're going to look at how color is created and used in visualizations. You can choose to spell color Americanly or in the English way or visualization Americanly or in the English way as you wish in this slide. The starting point here for the discussion is color physics and color models. Um, color is a difficult thing because it's very subjective. But if you look at the beginnings of color in optics, then it's to do with wavelength and our ability to perceive different wavelengths separately so that we can separate out and label colors as different different wavelengths of light can be labeled as colors. Light falling on the retina is detected and it's detected by rods and cones. And approximately there are three different types of cones and there are several models for how this works. But in the tristimulus model, there's a red, a green and a blue set of cones which detect different wavelengths of light or primarily detect different wavelengths of light. You'll see that the red and green cones overlap quite substantially in their sensitivity. You should also see in this slide that the blue cones are not very sensitive and that that lack of sensitivity is one reason why it was very hard to produce uh, LED uh, lights in blue because you have to put a lot more power through an LED uh, that's blue to get the same sensation of brightness than you do through a red and a green one. And while pure spectral colors are perceived from a single wavelength, many colors are perceived from a combination of different wavelengths, and you'll see that different amounts generate different colors. This tristimulus theory of color vision has been used for almost all electronic displays though. The CIE chromaticity diagram, which is shown here, shows all possible visible colors in that horseshoe shape around the, around the outer edge, and the spectral or pure spectral colors are at the edge of that horseshoe around the the line around the enclosing edge. And in the middle, there's mixtures of wavelengths give rise to other sensations. And at the very center, there's white, a mixture of essentially red, green, and blue components. The triangle shows the SMPTE color gamut for standard television monitors. Um, and you'll notice that that is red, green, and blue, and that standard displays use red, green, and blue uh, as their color basis. But it doesn't cover the whole of visible color space. So on a standard TV, you're not seeing the whole range of colors. And there are things like um, laser projectors that have very much more intense primary colors, red, green, and blue at the extremes of this triangle and, and cover a bigger gamut as a result. And if you've seen a laser projector system, you'll, you'll know it feels more colorful. And the reason is because it really is more colorful. It's, it's able to show more colors. It's worth saying that the color gamut while similar for CRTs and LCD displays, it's not the same. It's also very different when you're printing. And the, these changes in the displayable colors, the gamut of a device, are important if you're doing any kind of professional color work. And um, printing magazines, you need displays which are calibrated to show you what the print will look like, not calibrated to show you what other electronic displays will see. And the web has a huge problem in this, that you can't accurately reproduce color because displays don't all use the same color space. Although things are improving with RGB and sRGB standards. So what is the RGB color model? Well, it is the additive model we've talked about uh, previously where three primary colors, red, green, and blue, are mixed together to generate all the other colors. And the secondary colors in this color space are yellow, cyan, and magenta. So if you take two of the primaries, those are the secondary colors within the system. There's some examples here, and what these look like will depend very much on the coding system that's coded this video, what display you're viewing it on, and your own eyesight. But on the left, you can see we've got full red and green, which gives you yellow. Uh, this is on a color scale of 0 to 255 per color channel, so 255 color levels per color channel, something which again is changing in devices they're getting more color bits per channel 10-bit colors is quite common in studio tv recording for example on the far right there's a sort of pastel shade of blue which has got equal amounts of red green and blue in it and then more blue on top so it's got a kind of base white color in it and that gives you the more pastel effect the one in the middle is one of the most difficult colors to represent on any kind of display and that's orange. Uh, and finding a color of orange that is not brown on a particular display can be very hard. So it can be hard to reproduce it. 
What's known as true color or full color mode is changing, but traditionally it's been 8 bits per channel or uh, 16 million different proportions of red, green and blue uh, possible in, in color mixing. As the standards for cards and monitors uh, move up to 10 bits per channel, this is, this will be even more. And that will give you more shades and more levels of brightness rather than really more colors. Um, one of the important things to know is that within this 16 million color color space, they're not truly perceived colors. There are a lot of metamers, a lot of values of these three red, green, and blue numbers that give you the same perceived color at the end. RGB color has disadvantages. Um, it's a way of describing color at a device level. Uh, directly at what does the display do? It generates red, green, and blue, uh, and that's how we describe color. It's not a very good way for describing color if you're an artist or a designer, and there are several alternatives to that. Uh, HLS and HSL are two of them. The hue, uh, lightness, and saturation color model allows you to choose colors with some more possibly intuitive control. You can choose the hue or color around a circle. You can choose lightness, which is distance from black or white. Uh, and you can choose saturation, which is vividness, um, which relates to the degree of colorfulness versus pastelness versus grayness in the color. If you go to fully unsaturated, you'll get gray. If you go to fully saturated, you'll get 100% color in it. Quite different is the CMYK color model uh, used in printing. It's because it's a subtractive color model. So what does subtractive mean? It means that instead of a light generating screen, which generates mixtures of red, green, and blue, a printed page is a light absorbing plane or screen equivalent, where you lay down dye to reflect light, to absorb light and reflect light rather than generate light. So when you want to mix colors, you need to work out what things do I need to subtract from incoming white light to reflect, for example, green light. To reflect green light, you need to put down something which absorbs blue light and something which absorbs red light, and the result you'll get then is green. So if you print yellow and cyan on top of each other, they absorb between them red and blue light, and as a result, you see a green patch on the page. So. It's a question of absorbing incoming white light. What do you keep from that and what do you reflect back off the surface of the print? Because uh, mixing inks like this can produce quite a muddy gray color, if you print them on top of each other, it's not usually giving you perfect black. Most printers will have a K, a K value for black, and that will be a direct black dye which they print on to give them really good contrast. You remember how important contrast is, and if you can print with a black dye, you get a much better contrast in your images and they, they just look nicer and more appealing. Um, one of the things you can do is go back to comparing the gamuts. So in the CIE color space, so in the CIE color space, there's the red, green, and blue gamut and the CMYK gamut, and you'll see neither of them fill the whole of the perceived color space. So you can't print or display every color you can see, and they're different. And this comes back to that question, if you're working in printing, what you want to see in your monitors is what's printable, not what the displays can show. And there's a problem with that. The bits that the color inks don't cover, you can just switch off, but there's color ink reflectivity capabilities outside the gamut of a standard monitor. And that's a problem because you can't display those on the monitor at all. So in the worst case, you just end up working in the um, intersection of these two shapes in the middle. One last thing on the devices, always get it right in black and white. You, you will never be able to predict when someone will print out a visualization in black and white. So if you can check that your visualizations work in black and white, that they can be faxed to somebody, for example, there's a, a stereotypical view of color perception. Uh, and this was an online survey, I believe it's still there, you can go and look at it at Doghouse Diaries, that if you're female, you have a whole load more names for colors than if you're male. Um, actually, it turns out when they did a survey of over 200,000 people, this wasn't really true. For females, there was a slightly more names for colors, but not many, um, and nothing like the, the stereotypical view. I don't think the survey tested this. There might be some real color perception differences between genders, but uh, it's not really clear. So if you take that data, then these are the key names in RGB space um, if one of the values is zero. 
if you look at what the survey then tells you about the color space that you can use, it's not very big. Um, you can plot it out, and they did, and, and this is, there are not very many names for different colors that people will naturally perceive if you ask them. Within the survey, there's a set of 48 distinct colors um, that could be most reliably identified by people in the survey. Uh, one color that they found, once they'd filtered everything, that nobody could spell was fuchsia. There are many spellings of fuchsia that aren't right. Although everyone could kind of label the color of pink as fuchsia, there wasn't a huge absolute agreement on what that color was. Um, but if you averaged it out, you get those every one fuchsia shades, which are similar-ish. Let's look a bit more about choosing the color palette. If you look at some of the psychophysical surveys that Colin Ware's published, um, there's only six to 12 really very distinct colors, and they're here. Um, so that's great for categorical and nominal data. It's not really sh clear that it's great aesthetically, but you could put these up and we'll go red, green, yellow, blue, pink, brown, orangey, yellow, gray, and purple, and most people will be able to see these. It's quite common to use sequential color palettes, so you can vary um, one or more of the HLS components and get a nice sequential palette. That can be quite good for quantitative data, where you want equal steps in change in the color palette to represent equal steps in value. Um, Power BI lets you do this. We've seen that before. You can go in and set up quite a complex relationship between the data and the colors that come out based on functions and aggregations. And you don't have to color a bar chart on the numbers in it. You can color it on any other number in your data set. You can also do diverging color palettes. These can be good um, in maps, particularly where you want to separate two zones in a map or two ends of a spectrum in a map very clearly in the color space. And you can have a small range in say blue and a small range in red to show something about a neutral middle point. Again, you can select that in um, Power BI and say, can I have a diverging color palette, please? Um, I wouldn't say a lot about them. Power BI lets you have report themes and color themes for reports. Um, uh, and you can go in and have a look at that. And you can in, even download whole themes for these. I, s I said something earlier about mapping quantitative data to color scales. There's a report by Bernice Rogowitz from uh, IBM on this, uh, at the Witch Blair project, where she showed that if you don't have a monotonically, so that's step-by-step -step increasing luminance component, um, people find it quite hard to interpret that as a range. So the top color scale here, you couldn't easily use as an increasing range of a variable because people don't interpret that scale, that rainbow scale, which is very widely used as a range of increasing values. Whereas a change in lightness and the bottom scale from light on the right down to more saturated on the left, that gives you a scale where people will associate steps of color with steps of value in the data. Um, there's a really nice set of work done by Peter Covesi at UWA in um, Western Australia, um, where he's looked at perceptually uniform color maps. What makes things work perceptually? You can download these. I think some of them are now included for standard in R. Um, if you have to use the rainbow color map, he has one where at least you'll see the distinct steps in it. A good place to start for looking at color and color scales is Color Brewer. It, it's... Um, a tool on the web where you can go and ask for a set number of um, colors. It will also let you select only colorblind safe color schemes. So, um, so ideally what you want to do is select all your colors in here, pull them out, put them into a Power BI color scheme and use them. Okay, so what's the summary? We've got the optics of color, the light waves, feeding into perception of color. And that's where things get subjective and complicated. Do bear in mind that different devices won't show the same colors and black and white printing or faxing will happen to your pictures at some point. So work out how it's gonna look in black and white. Okay, I think that's it for this um, brief look at color. It's a huge subject area. Have fun looking into it more. Thanks.